author of this book, The Watchers, The Rise of America's Surveillance State, uh, which in 2010 won uh, Book Award, New York Library. Mm -hmm. Yep, the Bernstein Award. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Award, and The Economist named it one of the best books of 2010. So I highly recommend it. Actually, I'll say Jenny's reading it now, and she 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 brought it in so that I could demonstrate with it today, but she's refusing to give it back because she says it's such a good read. So Thank you. Um, so that's great. Shane currently is senior writer at Foreign Policy Magazine, where he covers national security, intelligence, and cybersecurity. He's also a fellow at the New American Foundation, New America Foundation, Previously, he's been at Washingtonian, National Journal, Government Executive, and Movie Line. <laughs> he really has done it all. <laughs> so he's going to talk about cybersecurity. And um, I, I know you've got some things planned to yep. say, but I think he's also very open to your questions and to talking about whatever aspect, you know, cybersecurity is a huge topic. So whatever aspect of it you guys are most interested in, um, Shane can pretty much address all of it. So thank you for being okay. here, Shane. Cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to um, MPF and to the fellows classes. It's a great program that you guys run. So thank you for having me in. Um, <clears throat> I guess I thought I'd talk a little bit about just kind of how I got into writing about national security and surveillance issues just briefly so you kind of know my background. Uh, <clears throat> and then try and do about most of the talk too. Um, sort of the, I guess, the trade craft of cybersecurity for journalists, which is something that's getting a lot more attention um, these days as journalists have come under more scrutiny from government officials who want to know who our sources are and are being subpoenaed more frequently. It's still pretty rare, but it happens. Uh, and then also with stories that we've seen about news organizations getting hacked, um, probably most prominently the New York Times in China, uh, some of their reporters, and I guess probably here too, but we're... we're appear to be targeted by Chinese intelligence services trying to figure out who they were talking to in China about stories that were really, really unflattering to prominent people in China. So sort of, you know, what we all have to do these days, I guess, um, without going to unbelievable extremes that make it impossible to do our jobs. Um, so I'll talk mostly about that, but please just ask me questions about any and all of the above. And, you know, I'm covering the NSA and the Snowden story as well. And to the extent that you have questions about that or what it's like covering that, um, I'm happy to discuss it too. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I got my start uh, actually here in Washington working for a magazine called Governing, uh, where I was covering state and local management issues, and they hired me in the late 90s when the internet was really novel, and they said we want a recent college graduate because we think the internet has great potential as a research tool. Uh, so it was kind of like this moment where really like we couldn't quite, like and we understood that the web and the internet was going to become something important to publishing, but not this sort of fundamental change in the distribution mechanism of what it is that we all do. Um, so it was kind of still a research tool at that point. Then they basically, you know, taught me how to be a reporter kind of without my knowing it. Uh, and then I moved to LA and got a job at a magazine called Movie Line, which Linda alluded to, which is no longer a print magazine, but I think it's a blog now. Um, and that was great because I, I, I wanted to live in LA. I was interested in the film business and I had this background in journalism and reporting. And they seemed to think that because I came from Washington, it was very serious, and this was a great credential. So <clears throat> they hired me to do a job that I was completely unqualified for, but that's fine. Um, I was editing and was there for about a year or so, editing and writing some pieces, and then decided to come back to Washington because I really just loved it here and was more interested in writing about government. Um, so I went to work for a magazine called Government Executive, which was part of the Atlantic Media Group with National Journal in the Atlantic. Um, and that was in 2001. And they assigned me to write about... Um, information technology procurement in federal government agencies. So basically, government agencies buying computers and, you know, stuff and services and all that, which was not the most, like, immediately sexy of beats. Um, but what it ended up doing was introducing me to a lot of people who worked in the tech industry here and, importantly, to a lot of big contractors. Um, and, uh, you know, you sort of everyone from your kind of high-level Lockheed Martin, Raytheon kind of like your Beltway Bandit types, down to people who were really kind of like innovative and trying to do new things with software. And it was the post-dot-com boom. So like all these companies that lost their shirts in Silicon Valley were thinking like, well, maybe there's a market in government for us. And so it was kind of an interesting time. I did that for about nine months and then 9-11 happened. And basically everybody, you know, who was on any beat in Washington pretty much kind of dropped what they were doing and figured out how does that connect to what's unfolding here. <clears throat> and for me it was... Um, both the the issue of 
uh, intelligence agencies not having communicated before the attacks effectively in a way that allowed them to sort of see all of the different clues lining up um, to the 9-11 attacks. Um, that kind of became a tech story insofar as a lot of these companies that I had been covering started rushing into that space saying, hey, we can help build computer systems for you that will anticipate the next attack. We can do things like data mining. We can do things like surveillance, frankly, um, that will help you get a handle on that. Um, and so suddenly this beat that was sort of you know, nominally about technology sort of taking on all of these different security and, and intelligence dimensions to it. Um, and over time, it just kind of evolved to where you know, I was writing about that you know, pretty much full time. Nobody at the magazine at the time had picked it up as a beat. There really, wa they really weren't a lot of reporters writing about intelligence at that time. I mean, you know, this is years after the end of the Cold War. You know, what does the intelligence beat look like when you're not writing about the Soviet Union and like, you know, and, and us fighting communists? Um, and now, obviously, it looks you know completely different and much more multifaceted. So, I kind of branched out from there, and you know, and it was interesting. Cybersecurity became an issue pretty soon after the 9-11 attacks in ways that were kind of hard to appreciate at the time. There were kind of like a band of people, many of the same ones who'd been working on the National Security Council staff and in some of the intel agencies before 9-11, who had been warning about al-Qaeda, uh, people like Richard Clark, who you may have seen you know, on TV as an ABC News consultant, former official, you know, were now sort of saying, okay, we've been taken by surprise by these terrorists. There are these other things that we have to worry about, namely that the internet is vulnerable to hackers and people who would get inside and steal information, but also disrupt communication systems and potentially shut down infrastructure like the power grid that is actually connected to the internet in some ways and run by it. So that kind of you know cybersecurity as the new thing to worry about was percolating back even back then, um, and obviously has now become kind of a topic du jour in Washington, where it's really sort of one of the leading national security priorities. You have, you know, President Obama gave a speech in 2009 where he said the internet was a strategic national asset. And you have the military setting up this thing called U.S. Cyber Command, where they're actually training our people how to be hackers and go out and steal other people's information, but also learn how to turn off the lights in other cities and be disruptive. Um, the Stuxnet virus, which may, many of you guys may be familiar with, is an example of how uh, you know we are reported to be building computer viruses that we use to go out and do things like shut down nuclear enrichment facilities in Iran. So cyber has become kind of this you know militarized kind of zone as well. So that makes it a very interesting space to write about, um, no doubt. Um, and you know, along with that, I think journalists in general their their awareness of the risk that we face out there on the internet and the risk to our privacy and the security of our information um, has heightened a lot to the point where now we're having to think about how we kind of incorporate security practices that normally would probably would have been only used by people in government to protect information to actually protect our information as well. So I'll talk a little bit about just sort of on, in a day-to-day -day basis how I and my colleagues uh, at Foreign Policy try and, um, you know, use good security practices to make sure that our information is not getting, not getting stolen, uh, to make sure also that we're doing all that we can to protect the identity of our sources with whom we inevitably are communicating electronically, uh, and to try and make it as, I guess, hard as possible for uh, third parties to figure out what it is that we're saying and who we're in touch with. Um, I should say at the outset, I think this is like, you know, this is not perfect, and there comes a point where I think that you can try and use so many different cybersecurity, if you like, tools that it almost makes it impossible for you to do reporting in an efficient way. So I think that it's important that you think about what it is that you're reporting on, how sensitive is it, and how you know extreme do you want to be in trying to protect yourself. So I kind of divide this into two categories, which is um, things that you do generally to protect your sources and the identity of your sources, uh, and also then to protect yourself and your own data. Um, so on sources, um, and, and interrupt me as I'm going, feel free. There's not like a beginning, middle, and end here. Um, uh, I think it's a good idea for all journalists to at least be familiar enough with um, email encryption programs that you would be comfortable you know, using them. Um, you know, you can use things like um, GPG or PGP. These are basically internet, enc they're encryption programs that you can download. 
Um, they're a little bit complicated to use. It's not just sort of like adding a plug on to your Gmail, a plug into your Gmail, um, but you can pretty easily find tutorials on how to do this. And basically, what this ha what this does is it allows you to communicate with another person uh, in an encrypted, secure way, such that if your if your message were intercepted, it would be nearly impossible for your average person to decipher what it is that you're saying. And importantly, what happens in these systems is that you create, or the system creates for you, a unique key that unlocks your encryption. And the other person has a key as well. And the, oh, the two of you are in touch with each other, and only the two of you can decrypt the message. And you've got control of what that key is. Um, this is a little bit different than, like, Gmail, which is encrypted, not completely point-to-point, -point, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you have more control over, uh, you know, the keys yourself. I like using it. It's not been something I've had to use a lot. There are very few sources with whom... I am, you know, in communicating in, in that kind of way. And actually, it's, it's probably even better to think about maybe even using it for story planning purposes. So if you were overseas, let's, let's say you were in China or you were in Syria and you wanted a more secure way to communicate with your editors because those are places where journalists are being monitored, you know, an email encryption program like GPG kind of creates a convenient way to do that. Um, a lot of reporters now are actually posting what's called their public key on Twitter, uh, or in there, or in, in the Twitter, uh, uh, in, in your bio area, and what that does is it's a link to another page where the the public key is actually housed. And the public key is what someone can take and basically use that as the way to contact you to initiate the encrypted uh, communication. So it's a way of, of giving somebody a way to contact you, and from the beginning, it's encrypted rather than trying that them contacting you and saying, "Hey, can we take this over to an encrypted channel?" Um, I think it's also probably a way of just signaling to sources out there who do know what encryption is and might have a reason for wanting to talk with you in that way that, you know, you're hip to that and you take it seriously and it's an option that's available. Um, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of journalists who cover national security uh, and intelligence issues doing that more lately, um, but I don't know why all journalists might not think about it. Yeah. How often do you have those situations where a source is coming to you? It's not happened, actually, since I started using that on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> in terms of in contacting me in an encrypted fashion, it hasn't or, happened yet. Or in general, I'm, I'm just curious as to how you go about developing. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, um, it, I think it's still rare that, you know, a kind of deep throat-like source, like, walks in almost and, set, and with something, um, you know, kind of ready-made to go. It's, hap it's happened to me before. I've had people contact me via mail twice. Which was which was really interesting. <laughs> um, like I got to work with. There was a guy who who was once I was working on a series of stories about um, uh, sort of a, it was kind of like a contracting scandal story, <clears throat> and um, there was a guy who was an insider, sort of a whistleblower, and he sent me stuff in the mail, and I always knew it was him because the return address said Harry Potter, <laughs> so, yeah, which was really cool, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> aliases and stuff, um, <clears throat> and then I had another source. Uh, once contacted me via mail, and then what happened was that <clears throat> after a few of those exchanges, um, he initiated a phone conversation, contacted me via phone, and basically said, I'm the person who's been sending you this, and you know we should get together. Um, <clears throat> that was also a good example of how I think it's important that when you do have that relationship with a confidential source or a sensitive source, you, you try to limit the phone engagement as much as possible. Um, you know, there are times where I think it's, you know, you have to have some way of signaling to somebody that you want to meet. And I mean, unless we're going to the level of like, you know, putting the, you know, the flower pot on the doorstep, um, <clears throat> there's going to have to be at some point some exchange or some signal. Um, one thing that I like to, you know, if, if a source is really sensitive, it, it's probably a good idea to just limit the phone interactions as much as possible. I've actually I talked to a federal prosecutor about this once, and he said that the law, when they go back and look at phone records with journalists and people who are under investigation for possibly being a leak, the longer the conversation lasts, the more suspicion it creates. So if you're somebody who works at the Justice Department and I've called you and the call lasts 10 seconds, that could be me calling you and you telling me to go take a hike and I won't talk to you. Or I guess it could have been me calling you and saying, you know, like, hey, hope we can get a cup of coffee or like, you know, whatever our code word is or whatever you know there's ways that you can create with with a, a source that kind of signaling um <clears throat> more often than not though i think on these beats what happens is um you get a tip or a piece of information in conversation 
from someone, and then you have to start running it down through a lot of different sources. Um, and, and, and there, too, you want to be careful about your operational security, for instance, avoiding email. Like, I, I just finished a story that went up today um, about this internal fight at the Justice Department between the Justice Department and the White House over the guy who got the nomination to be the, um, the head of national security for the Justice Department. Really big, important post. Um, and that required talking to a lot of, and there was controversy over it because a lot of people felt he wasn't qualified and because the Attorney General had initially not supported his nomination, but was overruled by the White House. Um, so the kind of thing that if you wrote that out in an email to someone as a potential source, like they would never reply because now there's this record of an interaction that, and, the, and it's just too sensitive. So that was just a lot of, you know, calling, frankly, and just cold calling people out of the blue, which I think is uncomfortable for some people, um, particularly if you feel like you're a little bit more introverted or you don't want to seem rude or pushy, but like we're journalists, we're allowed to be rude and pushy. So you just kind of have to, I think, kind of get over that anxiety if there is any and just get comfortable with calling people out of the blue. Um, ideally to, you know, calling them um, to arrange a meeting in person is, is a great thing. Um, if you have a source with whom you're in regular contact and the phone is really the most convenient way to do it, I recommend not calling them at work. Um, or not calling them on any phone that is um, issued to them by their company or by their agency um, because those records are basically not private. Um, so the, gov the government can go back and look at its employees' phone records. They can do that. Um, and they could then easily see that they've been communicating with you. Um, <clears throat> they can also subpoena your phone records. Now, the way this is supposed to work is that if the government wants to subpoena your phone records, they're supposed to go to the news organization and tell them they filed the subpoena, which gives the organization a time to fight it. Um, that used to be the case until recently when we learned that the Justice Department subpoenaed the AP's phone records without telling them. Um, the upshot, the upside, if there's a positive to that event, may be that because the publicity around that was so extremely negative and there was such a huge pushback against the Justice Department that they may have actually been scared off from doing that again. We'll see. Um, but in general, I mean, meeting people in, in, in person is much, much better. Um, I try to develop, I mean, obviously, for, I mean, obviously you want to be close to sources as much as you can and have as, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. Email encryption for a second. Mm -hmm. um, people can still send you not, I mean, bad emails, even though they're encrypted, right? Yeah. I, that, I mean, so the, the, when somebody sends you a malicious email with like a virus or some kind of a spyware on it, that's going to come as an attachment or in the form of a link trying to get you to go to a certain site where the malware would be downloaded. So encryption does not solve that. And that's another thing, too. You bring up a great point. I mean, <clears throat> and this just goes for, like, all of us in our daily lives in general, but especially if, I think if you're a journalist working on a really sensitive story, um, you do want to be very suspicious of emails that arrive with attachments or links, obviously from people who you don't know but even from people that you do know. So there's this technique called spear phishing, which some of you may be familiar with, where an email shows up that's designed to look like it comes from a trustworthy source, maybe even a colleague uh, in the building that you work in, but actually it contains a virus that implants spyware on your computer and allows whoever sent it to you to possibly copy and read your files. That's what happened in the New York Times' case. Um, so it appears that they were spear phished and that somebody fell for it and, you know, it, it can be an easy thing to do. I, I, I once interviewed somebody um, who worked in the State Department uh, in the Secretary's office and received an email from the guy in the office next door saying, hey, here are, the, here are the, the notes for the meeting tomorrow. And he got a little suspicious because there was no meeting tomorrow. So he got up and he walked across to the office and he said, did you just send me this email? And the guy said, I don't know what you're talking about. And that was very likely from an intelligence service or a foreign government trying to, you know, implant something inside uh, a computer, which happens a lot. Yeah. Um, one of my colleagues. And it does bring up the question about how, you know, how much as a journalist and a reporter do you want to document things? I mean, you know, unless you have a really fantastic memory, you're probably going to need to you know, write down your notes and write down the contacts and the names of people who are with you. Um, there, you know, some people will do things like there, um, you know, there are, there are, there are encrypted cloud storage programs out there. I mean, things like Dropbox. Not everyone likes Dropbox. But there are places where you can store data that's more secure that you only you have a password access to. Um, I do use Gmail because it is encrypted. Not completely, but now actually because of what the Snowden documents have revealed about the NSA actually trying to capture G, uh, Gmail when it's unencrypted. But when it's transmitting between Google's data centers and the Internet, there's a 
a brief period where it's effectively unencrypted, they are now implementing uh, more aggressive security and privacy controls, which will probably slow down the service a negligible amount. You won't really notice it, but will make it basically harder uh, to get into. Standing, we got. I do not believe that it completely deletes it from a cache. I'm not 100% sure. It deletes it from your machine. I know people who, who just who think that the off the record function of Gmail is not robust enough, but there are off there are apps that you can get that are true off the record chat apps, uh, and there are also encrypted um, apps out there. We experimented with one at work, uh, something called CryptoCat, um, which is a down is a web based um, uh, online chat uh, that you can use. It, it wasn't great for group chat. We have reporters in different um, locations, so we do use a, ch a chat mechanism to all stay in touch with each other. Um, which brings up another point, which is that if it's not encrypted, be very careful about what you say in the chat room. So, like, we refrain from talking about sensitive stories, um, and we just use kind of a shorthand. Let's so like, you know, we were working on a story about um, a potential case of Chinese espionage at an army base a couple of, you know, weeks ago. And I think we just called it, like, the C story or something like that, something innocuous. Uh, which makes it sound kind of like you're being paranoid, but, you know... The thing about these is, like, you, know, you have to kind of apply a discipline to this, you know, because you never know, you know, when you're going to really need this, you know, kind of this good trade craft. Um, meeting in person is obviously the optimal thing to do. Um, a number of sources have actually, in the wake of a lot of these leak investigations, I've noticed this, my editors noticed it too, are just much more reluctant to talk to reporters at all. And it's kind of got to the point where you almost have to bump into people kind of accidentally at events. Um, and fortunately, if you're a reporter in Washington, there are a number of, you know, events going on at think tanks and, you know, during conferences and talks all over the place where you're likely to run into people and to see them. Um, and so it, it makes it harder, obviously, and you have to adjust this based on the demands of your beat, I think. Um, for like for me on my beat, um, it takes longer to develop these stories. So I think I have a little bit longer leash to kind of, you know, go out to these things and try and bump into people. And my editor knows that I'm not just screwing around and like going to useless conferences. Um, and ideally too, you have, you know, enough of a social relationship, I think with sources such that you are going to see them more frequently. And also it creates, you know, I guess I would be discreet in the way I say this, but it does, if you have a reason to be seeing them anyway, it makes it harder for somebody to accuse them of doing anything improper with you. So to the extent that you just know these people and it's fine, it may look strange like you're alerting, like somehow like, wow, you seem to have a relationship with this person. Clearly they must be leaking to you. At the same time, you could say, no, everyone has a relationship. This guy knows a lot of reporters. So what? Um, so to some degree, kind of like hiding out in the open, I think is actually kind of a good thing. Um, now that doesn't necessarily go for people who are, you know, honest to God whistleblowers who are coming to you with classified information. And in the rare instances in which that happens, that's when I think you have to take more extraordinary measures as opposed to just a source that you know that occasionally tips you to things that they're hearing, which is a much more common kind of exchange, I think. Um, <clears throat> the question often comes up about whether to use um, burner phones um, or cell phones that you dispose of. Um, <clears throat> I don't personally do that, although for more sensitive calls, I will call from a line that's not associated uh, with uh, my office. Um, and, you know, it, at the end of the day, if the government has a legal order and they want to find out who is communicating with whom, they're going to find out. And as long as your name is on that phone record, you know, you know, short of getting a disposable phone or I guess using if we have pay phones anymore, I don't even know if we do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, so that's something to think about, too. I think that, you know, again, it depends on the beat that you're on. Um, if you're having conversations of a sensitive nature with someone, but they're not telling you classified information, you know, sure, you could call them on the phone. I mean, they they might get into a little bit of hot water if they're seen to be as being too cozy with journalists, depending on the nature of their job. There are a lot of people in government, by the way, who are authorized to talk to reporters. I mean, I know there are people who are very senior at NSA, which is an agency I cover, who I can call them, and it's fine. I mean, you know, and you don't have to say, why are you calling them, and they don't say, call the press office. There are a few people who just kind of are designated in some places to be in contact with the press, um, and, and I think there you don't need to necessarily worry about, you know, calling them from a disposable phone. But I think that if you were reporting in um, an area like another country where surveillance was much more pervasive, then it would probably be something to, to consider. Um, I have not reported from China, but I would not take my computer to China. Mm. 
-hmm. And I would not take my phone. Even with, like, VPN and all I mean, I would take a different computer with a VPN on it. Um, just because I would, like, my own computer, I'd be like, give me a clean, clean mm -hmm. box. And a VPN is like a virtual private network. It's a way of kind of tunneling through the Internet in a, in a, a secure way to get to your, your end source. Um, we actually ran an experiment where we had a reporter that was uh, in China for a, a series of unrelated things like going to conferences or whatever, and he took a clean laptop over and just brought it back to see what viruses were actually implanted on it just to test it. And there were a number that ended up on there. And this was a Mac PC? This was a PC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did those viruses, I mean, they don't just... <clears throat> I mean, figure he was when he was connected to a Wi-Fi. I mean, he kind of he didn't. I mean, he used the computer as he normally would, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, in hotels and elsewhere. Right. Um, didn't take any special precautions. <clears throat> right, exactly. He sort of went over as if he were, you know, tr not, not you know, basically making himself vulnerable, mm -hmm. but not you know, going out of his way to do it. I found I, I picked up some malware in the Dubai airport. Now, okay. Which was uh, interesting. I don't know what it did, but. <laughs> yeah, sources have told me that airports are often, a, I mean, a, pla a place to watch out for that. I mean, the airport in Beijing, I had a, a, a source uh, who used to be the director of counterintelligence for the, for the government, and he was saying, you know, you'll off frequently find that people, as soon as they walk into the airport, there will be Wi-Fi networks kind of popping up, and if you're looking at your phone, like, well, what are all these Wi-Fi networks? Well, they're kind of scanning. Yeah. So they're much more aggressive about it there. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and there are people who won't even connect to Wi-Fi networks, I mean, publicly here. I mean, you know, a lot of these risks, you know, uh, we face as well here, but they're, they're probably more uh, uh, of a criminal nature, people trying to implant a bug on your computer to, you know, conscript it into a botnet, which is where somebody controls a lot of systems remotely and sort of, like, forces your machine to become a slave to whatever spam it's sending out. And you might notice that as your computer is slowing down and acting really sluggish, well, that may be one reason why. Um, but I think that when you're reporting, obviously, in some of these other places, if you take extra precaution, particularly if they're trying to get into your system to find out who your sources are. So, again, that goes into the sort of protect your sources category. Um, and then there are other things you can do as well <clears throat> that get, even get down to the really the, kind of the, the online reporting to even make yourself safer. Um, you know, some people will consider using, um, if they're searching on LinkedIn, which is a great reporting tool for journalists, a great way to find people, um, searching from a different account that's not actually your name. Mm -hmm. So just so just so that there's no record of like, hey, they viewed your profile. I mean, if, if somebody, you know, in government you're trying to contact were ever investigated and they were to say, show us your social media accounts and it shows a list of people who've tried to contact you, that could create suspicion. So no, there are ways. And there may be times that you don't want that person to know that you're a journalist looking at their profile. So maybe, you, you know, you create a different profile to do that. I, mean, I think it's you know it's total right. I mean this is this is the bargain that we make. I think when we become reporters, is you know you are willing to put it on the line to protect your source's identity and to make that commitment to their confidentiality. And if that includes you know being found in contempt of court and going to jail, I mean that's that, I think that every reporter wants to believe that he or she would do that. Um, and I think that you have to really make an honest assessment of, of yourself of whether you would go that far to do it. And if, you want, and if you're not prepared to do it, I mean, then don't tell a source that you would. But if you know. first, if you're oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. Like, I mean, if somebody were calling me from their office line in a government agency, I would probably say you should hang up the phone and call me from, like, you shouldn't call me from that number. I mean, just because they might not have be as sensitive or attuned to it as you would as a reporter. Um, you know, <clears throat> ideally when they're, you know, the people who are sending you stuff in the mail, like, are clearly already paranoid, right? Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think it's a good idea to remind them and to kind of take the lead on it, too. Um, I think that that's, that's appropriate. Um, <clears throat> so this is in the category of things that I think are more kind of aimed at protecting yourself. And these, these overlap, this protecting sources and protecting yourself. But um, obviously there's just the basic hygiene stuff of being very careful about opening emails with weird attachments. Um, you know, it never hurts that if somebody sent you an email with an attachment to just pick up the phone and say, did you actually send this to me? Um, and in newsrooms these days, you do have to be much more careful of that because, uh, you know, we've had the New York Times incident. I think that the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal both reported that they were, that their networks were compromised. Um, I believe that FP's network was once attacked by the Syrian Electronic Army. But that was different than, what's that? AP2. Yeah. And that was, that's, I mean, that, and that's a bit different. Like a, a denial of service attack on your website is different than someone trying to get into your internal network. 
Um, <clears throat> but you know, there's like a little just an ounce of prevention here, and then just sort of looking at an email and making, being very careful before you click on anything, I think is definitely good. Um, again, I use Gmail for my everyday. I think it's pretty secure. It's going to get more secure um, going forward. A lot of email service providers are, are, are thinking about this idea too of um, right now what happens is when they encrypt the data, they essentially have the keys to unlock it, and the government can come to them and say, you know, give us the emails that we want and give us the key. Um, what, what some providers are talking about doing is moving to a system where the senders and the recipients have the keys, such that if you and I are sending an email to each other and the FBI wants it and they go to Google, Google could say, don't look at us, it's encrypted and we don't know how to unencrypt it. We don't have the key, we don't have the algorithm, you're going to have to get it from them. Um, so in a little bit of a way, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, making you a bit more the target, but it's also giving you more control. Um, but again, I don't put anything sensitive in the email anyway, so, but it never hurts to just be as secure as you can. Um, uh, Google offers something called two-step authentication with Gmail if you use it, which I highly, highly, highly recommend turning on. And basically what this does is every time that you log into your Gmail from a new device, it asks you to input a code. And it can be a code that is a unique, it's a unique one-time code, it only works once. And it can be sent to your phone, um, it can be sent to, uh, it can also be um, a series of, of, of codes that you print out on a little card and carry with you, and you can use each one once. And it's just a way of making sure that, from, from Google's perspective, that the person who's logging in is actually you. And what it also does is it prevents um, anyone from taking your Gmail address and then figuring out what your password is and then logging in that way. So that if they were trying to log, if they captured your Gmail address, which is obviously very easy to find, and they went to their computer and they tried to guess your password, let's just say you had a weak password, <clears throat> they could be in to your system very easily. But if you have two-step authentication on, they could not get in. Picked it either. I mean, I just wouldn't take the device that I ordinarily use. Anything with a Wi-Fi connection, mm -hmm. I wouldn't use. Or anything with a network connection. And if and there, you know, there, there were even, I mean, in the category of sort of extremes. Um, before the Olympics in Beijing, the National Counterterrorism or Counterintelligence Advisor got on the uh, the CBS morning show and advised people that if you were traveling to the Olympics, not to take your phone, and if you did take it, remove the battery, because there are ways to basically monitor the phone even when it's off. Oh my God. Wow! So, he, so that, that's like you're talking about, like, whoa, geez. I mean, he was really serious. Um, Can you he remove the battery from an iPhone. I don't think you can. I mean, I mean, it's going to ruin the phone, so you're kind of out of luck there. And I think he was talking about Blackberries, which, I mean, I don't think those exist anymore. So. Going back to the phones, um, I know reporters in my newsroom do this where they have a Google Voice number because it masks their actual number. Mm -hmm. So was, is that something that's recommended? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. I haven't personally done that, but I think that's a good step. There's also, um, <clears throat> you can buy... Um, services that will actually do <coughs> uh, encrypted phone calls. Uh, there's a company called Silent Circle, um, which I like. Um, I, ha I know their their founders. The, one of the founders is the guy who actually invented PGP, which is a very commonly available encryption algorithm that you can use, and it stands for pretty good privacy, mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty easy to use. <coughs> Silent um, Circle, you said? Yeah, Silent Circle. Oh, okay. Um, we are right now talking with them about actually getting a whole kind of like suite of services for all our reporters. Um, so they do encrypted phone calls, which are really useful. I mean, I think practically essential if you are reporting from like a really sensitive area like Syria or something where like the surveillance is just pervasive. And, and in a case like that, you know, you where the interception of your phone call and the communication with the source could actually jeopardize the life of that source. Um, uh, <clears throat> they used to have at Silent Circle uh, an encrypted email uh, function as well, but they voluntarily suspended it uh, because uh, this is during the summer in August. There was a company called LavaBit, which also made an encrypted uh, email service um, that was actually used by Edward Snowden uh, to communicate with people. And the government went to LavaBit, and what we believe, and it's been hard because LavaBits were restricted in what they can say is that the government said to them, we want all of the encryption keys for all of your clients. Basically, give us the store of how to unlock everything that your client, a, 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 of all, all the emails of your customers, because we need to find this one guy's email. And LavaBit shut its company down. Mm. Like they said, we are ceasing operations effective immediately because, and it wasn't even like an act of, it was partly an act of protest, but it was also like, we can't be in business 
if we can't guarantee to our customers that the very thing they're coming to us for, we can't actually offer them. I mean, it's sort of like the, the, the you know, this analogy to reporting. It's like I can't do, you know, reporting with confidential sources if, unless I can protect those sources. I mean, if the government were just able to come and force me to divulge them or get them from me easily, nobody would talk to me. So LavaBit put itself out of business and Silent Circle suspended its email operation that day. But they are moving towards a new, what they think is a more secure system, so they might be offering that again. So all that's to say is that there are actually packages that you can uh, buy. Uh, this is, I mean, this is something you actually do have to pay for or you get your news organization to pay for. I think it's like 50 bucks a month. And basically it just rides on top of your phone. It's an iPhone app. And that allows you to, as long as the other person has Silent Circle, that's the thing. They have to also have it too. Um, but it's good for reporters working together who just want an extra layer of security. Um, uh, strong passwords. Um, strong passwords that you change often. I mean, there was a great story in Wired magazine maybe about a year ago uh, by this guy who basically just had his entire life, you know, ripped apart by somebody who stole his identity. Uh, and what, and it was basically the crux of the story was your password is useless. Um, th the best thing I think you can do is try and come up with a really long password um, that you can remember, but that you change often and try not to use it for more than one application, which sounds like really, really a pain in the ass, and it's a huge pain in the ass. Um, but there are some services that you can get to make it easier. There are things called password lockers, which we talked about this on the webinar last time. I have yet to try this out because I've, I kind of have managed my own way of changing up my passwords, and I think they're hard to guess, but we'll see. Um, and so there are places where you can go and you can store the password, and basically you don't have to remember them, but it's a secure way of writing it down, and you just remember the password for the locker. Approximately how many passwords do you have? Oh, geez. I mean, between email, Twitter, you know, Amazon, banks. I mean, we probably all do. Like, you know, 20. more than a dozen, 20, yeah. Do you, do you and you can do that kind of, you know, for... I, mean, I guess you could do that across many sites, right? If you had like that was like the initial der you know part, and then like dollar sign one exclamation point was what was at the end of everything, then that might be a way of kind of adding on a little bit. But something that's easier for you to remember. That's the other thing that password about long passwords is it should be ideally something you can remember, not a string of random numbers. Yeah. Now, if you have a way of storing the random numbers in a password locker and all that, I mean, great. Um, but yeah, ideally something that you would remember, and 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 having a way to kind of you know, trigger it. I mean, so there's like, I mean, without like saying how I do mine, there's sort of like there's a there's a there's a common string in each of my passwords that helps me remember for which site I'm using it. That's all. I mean, there's just there's a little way that I remember. Right, this is the Amazon password. Right, that's the Apple password. And it's just a little mental cue that I do. Um, and if I told you what it was, you'd know the password. So. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> but oh, and email aliases. This is another thing that I like. Um, I actually do this with um, uh, my Amazon and my Apple uh, accounts because um, Amazon and Apple store a lot of data in the cloud, uh, and, and then it you know, gives access to multiple devices. Um, using an email that is not your name. So you know, it's a lot of times people's usernames and passwords are, you know, you've got your password, but your username is your, is your email address, or it's some very derivation of your name. But if you set up like a Gmail address, it's like if your name, you know, I would set up like Bob Smith. Well, that's, well, that's a bad example because that's, that's too common, but you know, but whatever. Bob Smith will take it. Um, and like I use Bob Smith at gmail.com for Apple and iTunes and for Amazon, but that's not where people contact me, right? So that I, whenever I'm logging in, I use that Gmail address. It's just a way of, of, use, of picking a different username than your actual email address because somebody could take your email address and go to Apple and try and then guess your password. So, if, he, so if your username is your, G, is your email address, they're already halfway there. Well, not halfway because the password's hard to guess. But does that, you guys know what I mean? Like, so they're basically using a different username um, and, and doing email aliases for that. And that's just as simple as just setting up a, um, like if you use Gmail, setting up a Bob Smith at Gmail uh, account. And then you can go into Gmail and have it forward those messages to your normal Gmail account so you don't have to keep logging into it to check. Um, so, like whenever I get communications from Amazon, it shows up with the fake name that, you know, it says dear and then my fake name and that's how, you know, for initially it was kind of weird because I was like, wait, who is that? Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, <clears throat> I like those for, uh, uh, 
services that a where you have stuff in the cloud and then also with anything with your credit card attached to it it's just a way of making sure that somebody can't then get into your account information and take financial information uh, as well um, and again that that article in wired kind of goes into uh, and I'm blanking on his name right now it's Matt um, I'm forgetting but if you google like your password is useless wired magazine his whole life got hacked and he is a pretty sophisticated guy, so he writes a lot of these tips, which I've adopted too. Oh, Matt Conan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's this terrifying story, um, you know, what, what happened to him. And it's also kind of an indictment too of the way that a lot of websites and internet services have constructed themselves to be so dependent upon passwords to identify you. Um, you know, when I'm sure probably most people's passwords are really easy to guess. I, th I feel like I read this. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I feel like I read this one place that the most common password is password. <laughs> and one, two, three, four. And one, two, three, four. Right. And you know, and I mean, you know that happens, right? Like, I mean, my mother does this, and I'm like, oh my god. I mean, come on. Um, <clears throat> so there's just you know all these kind of things that you can do collectively um, make it easier. Uh, you know, all that said, I mean, I think it's, it's it really is a matter of how far do you want to go and how far do you think you need to go. So like, I think that email aliases, strong passwords, and two-step authentication. I think those are things just everyone should do because that's going to protect you from you know, identity theft and criminals. And it also might protect you from people who are trying to spy on you because you're a reporter, um, depending on where you're working. Um, and then as far as the other things that you do, like encryption and the sort of the trade craft that you do with sources, I think that really is situationally you know, dependent. Um, but just to emphasize, like avoid email with them at all costs. I know I said encrypted email, but still avoid email. Um, and just meeting in person is just, it still it continues to, I think, be the best way to the extent that you can. And I also think it just makes for better reporting, just in general, I think it, it's, it's, it's a lot better. Um, and then the last thing that I kind of like put in the category of optional, and people are, have different views on this, is the question of whether to destroy your notes. Um, some companies, I think, make it a policy that you destroy notes and destroy email correspondence um, after you finish a story. Um, I can't do that because I write books and I just can't imagine like, I mean, I, I you know, I'll, I'll take interview notes that I don't get to a year and a half later and I can't imagine what I would do if I didn't have those. But that's something that some people, you know, often think is, like <clears throat> um, it's important to remember too, one of the reasons people think about destroying notes in the first place <clears throat> is that if you're subpoenaed, you know, for your notes, you know, and you have to give them over, it's obviously going to identify the source. Um, I was thinking about this this morning. I don't know if this has ever been tested. It probably has, but it raises the question of what if you wrote notes in such a way that it did not have the source's name in them? I would imagine, though, that a judge probably could compel you to say, which person is this? And I guess if you had, as a practice, not putting their names in there, you could say, well, I don't know and I don't remember. But I guess if that ever got out, that might be kind of embarrassing <laughs> as, you, as a reporter. Um, <clears throat> being like, yeah, I don't remember who told me these things. Come talk to me. <laughs> it's kind of a bad idea. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I hang on to notes. <clears throat> and I think that, uh, you know, just in general, I think it's, you know, I are on the side of you're going to need these again. And if you're a beat reporter, you know, you're going to keep coming back to things that people told you before. And, I mean, I can't count the number of times that I've gone back to notes and later and thought oh god this thing this person told me six months ago and I didn't know what it meant but I wrote it down and now it's so much clearer so I put that in that optional category Can just stop for a second because this is I think a very interesting point how many of you have newsroom policies around either saving <coughs> or destroying notes yeah because if, because if you don't if you as a practice you don't if you if you don't keep notes you can actually say when the government comes I don't keep notes right. And you can only do that if it's true. Like if you say, well, you know, I've only done this once. They're like, no, 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 no. We, you got notes in there someplace. So it's got to be a consistent practice for that to hold as a defense. Now you could do things like, I mean, I've done this with extremely sensitive sources of not using the name but making up a name that only I remember um, and using that in there just, just to remember who that person was, which doesn't necessarily prevent you from having to identify them to the authorities because they would be like, you know, you know who is Squirrel Girl? You know, or whatever, David. I, mean, I would presume you'd have to. But if they were intercepted by, you know, by a government or by somebody who was trying to spy on you, then they might not. That might make it harder for them to know who that person was. So you might consider doing that too. Yeah. 
I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do, and I and I store them uh, 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 in the cloud, but encrypted. And I'm, and I'm and I'm careful about that too. I mean, I'm, I'm if I think it's something that's going to be really particularly sensitive, I'll write it on paper, and then just keep it in the office. But if it's just sort of more in the common like keeping notes, I will um, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, we use that too. Uh, we collaborate with Google Drive, and, and I like it because, you know, again, presuming everybody who is sharing the document is following, you know, two-step authentication and has a strong password and all that, you know, it should be pretty tightly controlled, just among the group. Um, you know, it doesn't. And that doesn't account for like if you lost your computer and you didn't have a password on the screensaver and somebody were able to just open up your computer and open up the window and see the last thing that you had open, they could read the document. But that's more of a physical security. Um, <clears throat> but, but I mean, I like those. I mean, because I, I think that Google in general, I think, does a pretty good job of, you know, of giving you things like the two-step and encrypting emails and that. And that. So that, there comes a point where um, the convenience factor has to be weighed too. And for us, Google Drive and shared documents are a really easy way to keep track of story ideas and to file stories too. And it allows you to be in there at the same time with an editor. And if you're at the point too where you're about to file a story, I mean, the, the, I mean, the risk is pretty low. Like, you know, if you're literally writing a story that's going to be published in an hour, it's going to be published anyway. So I feel like their collaboration system is, you're not, you're not taking any risks. I haven't done that in a while um, because I guess I've just been sort of turned off from people I talk to about antivirus technology and just feeling like it's not great. Um, you know, I use a Mac, which is, you know, purported to be safer, although I don't know if that'll always be true. Um, but, you know, there are things that you can download just to, like, do ad trackers and stuff like that, just to see if, like, any, like, cookies and things have been inserted that might have uh, uh, hurt your system. And then, of course, there's, you know, there's just the, you know, the, the, the Norton antivirus and stuff that that comes with. But again, you know, I feel like that's just sort of like one line of defense. Do you know what I mean? It's like really, really sophisticated hackers are going to find ways to get in through things like spear phishing. And I feel like if you're just more cognizant of that and about not visiting websites that, you know, if, you're, if your Chrome browser tells you this website could be dangerous, like don't go to it um, at all. Um, so this thing, I think, feel like that paying more attention to that helps a lot. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so there's this idea that you could have um, what's called an air gap, um, which is a machine that is literally not connected to the Internet, either wirelessly or by a cable. Um, and it was just basically, it's a box. It's, you know, it's a, you know computers like we used before. There were network computers. Um, and that you could use that for, um, for instance, loading a thumb drive that maybe you don't know, like, you know, what's on the thumb drive a source gave it to you, but you want to make sure that there's not a virus on it and you could load it onto that machine so that it was um, just safer. Because if there was a virus or a piece of spyware on it, it's not going to go anywhere. It's sort of just contained. Um, <clears throat> and again, I think that would be, we haven't done that in our newsroom, but I think that if we got to the point where we did have a, a reason to, that, you know, that would be something that would be, uh, you know, an easy way of solving the problem of like, well, hey, I've got this thumb drive and I don't want to stick it on my computer, but I want to know what's on it. You know, what do I do? Air gapping, yeah. So literally, what the, what the idea being that there is a gap between the network and the device. So and that's in that the gap is air, and, and that um, because there's no connection to it, you're not at risk of a virus getting on it and then spreading and infecting the rest of the network. Um, which also kind of brings up another point too. I think that's important. This kind of is more in the realm of physical security, but um, we notice this working in a very busy newsroom. I do think it's important that. Um, <clears throat> reporters like a respect the fact that like anything a colleague says in a newsroom stays in the newsroom i mean i overhear conversations we all do <clears throat> um and sensitive conversations at that uh i don't like to hide from my colleagues like what story i'm working on because they may have some ideas and they may have tips and they may have leads but i do think it's incumbent upon all of us as reporters to like a respect that confidentiality and, you know, and B, when it comes to a point where you do have to have a more sensitive conversation just to remove yourself from a newsroom uh, and go someplace and have it in a quieter area. So, I mean, I had, I've done that in a couple of stories recently where we, ha we have a little small conference room off to the side where you can kind of close the doors. And I think that's just, that's, it's better operational security and it also kind of relieves your colleagues of, if, of the burden of like not wanting to overhear you talking to somebody about something that maybe you don't want to broadcast yet. Um, which is sort of, again, that falls more in the realm of just kind of, you know, 
common sense, I guess, too. But but it's important these days. It really, really is. And and, and to the extent that there are people coming and going in a newsroom, you know, including like interns who don't stay very long or people who haven't done this for very long and who chat with their friends over a drink about, hey, I heard this crazy thing in the newsroom the other day. I mean, Washington especially is a really small town. I mean, I even find myself just having to, you know, when I'm out socially and people say, what are you working on? I mean, you know, sometimes you want to just be like, oh, I, I don't know, because we're in a group of people and maybe one of you, like your boss is the guy I'm working on. I don't know. <laughs> um, so discretion is, is a big part in all of this, too. Uh, and just being sensitive to the fact that you know, what you're working on, you know, you don't necessarily all know who's overhearing it and who you might meet socially that maybe shouldn't hear what you're working on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it's it's... It really is about organization, I think. Um, I found when I wrote my first book that the key to it was um, I actually wrote the narrative as a series of storyboards. So I knew it was going to be narrative uh, nonfiction, that it was going to have like a beginning and a middle and an end. And I you know, really carefully took the time to just write this out as a series of scenes and chapters and acts and really kind of know what was going to go in this chapter. And, okay, this scene happens to get us to this point, to get us to that point. Um, <clears throat> so that helps a lot. But beyond that, it's also just <clears throat> as you're, you know, going about the course of your normal reporting, coming up with some way of kind of organizing and indexing your notes or pulling out things that you want to use. So like on my last book, or the, sorry, the one I'm working on right now, my second book, I actually have this program that I love. I'm kind of an evangelist for it called Scrivener. Yeah. Okay. I love Scrivener. I think it's great. Basically what Scrivener is, is it's a virtual note card and cork board system. And so <clears throat> like when I wrote the first book, I mean, everything kind of had like a little note card and it was a scene and I would tack it up on the wall. And basically Scrivener is just that, except virtually. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of just a souped up word processor with better organization. And so what I would do with, with for this book is as I was reporting and I would come across something where I'd say like, ooh, that could make a good scene or a good bit or a good moment in the narrative of this book, I would just write that down on a card and then just drop it into a card file. And then months later, I was able to go back and have all those things kind of written down as scenes. Not like, oh, remember to write something about zero-day attacks or, oh, remember to write something about the Homeland Security Department. But something that I heard or like an event or a person to talk to, a little bit more specific. And then kind of being able to go back to those and jog my memory and then reorganize those notes and then plan the writing around that. Um, but it, it does require like that, just like constantly kind of paying attention to how else can I use this? What other stories could this be in service of? Um, you know, generally the kind of things I think you have to do on a beat, um, whereas if you're a general interest reporter, you know, it's one story, then you're on to the next and you kind of lose the thread. So I just, I, for me, it's really just about that organization. And then the time management part, I mean, setting aside a certain number of hours in the day to work just on the book and on nothing else. And sometimes that means getting up really early or staying up really late. But I think if you can do that, then you can juggle the demands of both. And ideally, the beat serves the book. I mean, if I were working on a book that was about a completely different topic than what I cover, it would be a lot harder. It would just take longer, take a lot longer. Yeah, I guess that, like, in the abstract, I do worry about them because how can you be sure and what's the, you know, the supply chain security on them and is it coming up the works? Um, I mean, fortunately for me, I don't have to work on the production side that much at FP, so I don't know a lot about the things that we're integrating into our system. We actually launched a, re uh, uh, a new version of the website today. Yeah, so it's, it's a little glitchy right now, but like, thank God I didn't have to deal with that. Although I was one of the beta testers, which was a real pain. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, like for my personal website, I've always just kept it really, really simple and really stripped down, partly because I'm not great with code. And I did not code my website. Somebody did it for me. Um, but, you know, I'm also just, like, a little suspicious of, you know, all this third-party stuff getting on there. And, you know, it's like I don't, um, I don't like apps that want to connect to Facebook or want to see my contacts. I just, I just avoid that stuff, partly out of privacy, but also because I don't know what it's doing with them. And just the idea of giving a third-party application access to something that, you know, I am usually going to great lengths to try and protect doesn't make a lot of sense to me thought as well like yeah 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 outrage just seems kind of crazy yeah you know it's been such an interesting thing why why has this story sparked so much anxiety and sparked so much outrage i mean <clears throat> you know um i did a, i did a radio interview uh probably about two or three days into the snowden leaks and it was about my book 
and the interviewer asked, you know, like, so you wrote this book about this stuff and that came out three years ago. Are you surprised by any of this? And my initial answer was not really, because, I mean, I think a lot of what has been revealed, you know, is in my book. It's in else other places. What we didn't have were documents. We didn't have as many code names as we have attached to it now. I think that's been a big reason why the story has surprised so many people, or, or it's for sure why it's been of interest even to people like me who cover this stuff. It's just like there's more specificity. Um, there are a few things that were shocking. So the idea that the Patriot Act was being interpreted in such a way that a judge would say it was reasonable for an investigation to collect every phone record of every American in the United States. That was like, whoa, really? And a lot of like, and a lot of legal experts who I know and respect, including people who are very much in favor of you know surveillance, they even look at that and say that's a stretch. That's a, that that one's a stretch. But something like Prism, no. I mean, like we had a debate about amending the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in such a way that we knew that the government would go to companies and say, give us tons of information about the following people. Um, so I think that the idea that this is somehow revelatory is not exactly right in the sense that we did know a lot about this. But then there are things like finding out that the NSA has been, you know, actively undermining encryption standards. So NSA are code makers and code breakers. That's what they do. They're really good at it. And they frequently are asked to collaborate on uh, uh, encryption algorithms and things that are going to be made available for people to use to keep us all safe and keep our data safe. And the reporting shows us that in some cases, they were inserting weaknesses into those encryption algorithms that only they knew about. So you're kind of encouraging people to adopt something, but then you built this secret backdoor into it. And that's duplicitous. Um, and that's a real shame because there's a real history of, you know, honest science and cryptology and cryptography at the NSA. And I think their reputation has taken a real hit because of that. So some of those things were surprising. I would say probably about 15% of what I've seen is like truly, wow, that seems really new. But then didn't everyone want, like, everyone wanted 9-11 to be prevented, but then when you hear that they actually are spying, you're like, oh, I don't like that. So yeah. Like, what is the balance? <clears throat> well, I think this is this is the big question. I mean, and, you know, it's sort of like after the Boston bombings happened and people said, you know, well, why didn't you stop it? Like, well, I mean, would you want us to monitor everyone's cell phones in Boston? I mean, because that's the answer. And by the way, that's not even going to work because you'll never be able to analyze all the data. There's too much of it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, uh, to me, I think it's just sort of, um, it's kind of like the debate over when journalists public cl publish classified information and when they don't, that there's no hard and fast rule. There's this con con kind of set of constantly shifting decisions and different variables and I think maybe that's kind of what it is in the context of of national security um, I think what's definitely the case is that we haven't known probably enough about what these agencies actually do with the data and like clearly not enough Americans have been aware that it's happening I mean just the level of interest and surprise by this certainly indicates um, that a lot of people didn't realize it was happening and so that's a good thing that people are getting up to speed now I think um, and the other thing is, now that you have Edward Snowden as a face attached to it, that changes everything. That makes it a completely different story and so much more compelling. Yeah. Is a little bit of like um, when the single meeting that they had with um, Right. That 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 was a revelation too. Yeah. Cell phone that we were yeah. Um, and then the uh, stuff with the, the Google and all that. Yeah. Things. Yeah, and I think, and, and I look, I look at this maybe with a bit of a jaundiced eye because I have been reporting on it for a while, but I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, he has changed the conversation that we have about this stuff. And by pushing it into the open has basically made it so that I think the NSA just presumes that everything that it's doing will come to light or that much of it will. Um, and so I think that that's ultimately probably a positive thing. I mean, you can debate about how the information's been reported. You can debate about whether it's all been reported accurately. Some of it clearly has not been reported accurately. But if you just look at the totality of it, I mean, it's kind of breathtaking, you know, what he did. I mean, there's never been somebody who's revealed this much information in such a huge whole kind of way that it illuminates an opaque system like that. And also underscores the, I mean, look what's happened to the Guardian, you know, mm -hmm. the enormous pressure that they're under for doing good journals. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's very very tough. I mean, I have I have a good friend who is uh, a national security reporter there, and just talking to him about 
what they go through in the newsroom and the pressures that they feel that they're under, particularly in the UK, where the laws against reporting this stuff are pretty strict. Um, you know, and their and their fear that they too could become the target of litigation or a prosecution. It's you know, it, it's really scary. And it, 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 it's, it's interesting to talk about all of this stuff in the abstract, but I think if it were happening to you personally, it would feel much more urgent. Yeah. You had a question back there, and I'll come back around to all three of you. Yeah. I'm just curious. One of the things that I guess... No, I felt... Yeah, no, I felt that that culture was there. I think what, what's happened is that it, it, we've seen just so many examples of it now, and it almost seems cavalier. Um, you know, there, there's an atti- the, the kind of pervasive attitude at the agency has been this is all okay because we don't spy on Americans. And to them what that means is we don't spy on Americans for political purposes. So we don't do the kinds of things that the agencies and the FBI and the CIA did in the 50s and the 60s, which is, you know, spying on dissidents and activists and, you know, a Supreme Court justice and Martin Luther King. You know, we don't do that. And they seem to have kind of divided the world up into, like, well, U.S. persons and American citizens who are protected and then everybody else who's sort of free, fair game. And I think that's probably one of the things that they underestimated the most is the extent to which in a world that, like we live today, where we are more connected, where we do perceive of things like the Internet as a global commons, this idea that the agency would say, well, we're going to divide the world up into two categories of people, Americans and then foreigners, and then we'll just like scoop up all of their data and probably a lot of Americans with it. But don't worry, it's for a good cause, and we're only looking at foreigners anyway. That's just dumbfounding to me. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's plenty of ways to get data on Americans that doesn't necessarily mean it's the, it's the contents of their phone call or their email. I mean, they're collecting everyone's phone records. I, again, that's kind of like, you know, why? What, 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 do you, what is the purpose of this? And the answer for them is, you know, we have to prevent another attack, and in order to do that, we need to have all of the information. They're, they're driven by a big data kind of mentality. They were doing big data before the term was really coined and it's this idea that you have to find in order to find the needle you have to take the whole haystack and that's real i mean that's a real driving mission philosophy for them and what's happened over the years is that there's i think that in the bush administration they were encouraged to do this by secret authorizations and people particularly from the white house pushing them to do it i think in the obama administration there's been much more of a kind of um, a distance from the white house and the intelligence community I mean, there's kind of, um, it's not to say that they ignore it, but, you know, I think that the relationship that this president have, has with the intelligence community is much more removed. And there's a sense that nobody in the White House really understood how far the NSA had gone, or that not enough people really understood how far they'd gone. And the system has kind of taken on a momentum of its own. And what you're going to, I think what you're seeing now is, because of all these revelations, the questions of do we need to sort of roll this back and, and wind that down a bit? And that's going to be really hard. I mean, you, if we had had that conversation in 2002, you know, one year after the 9-11 attacks, it would be much, much easier because there were fewer systems in place. They were doing less, and they'd been around for less time. But now, more than a decade on, it's just, I mean, you know, there are equities at stake now and jobs and line items, and it's just it's, its own universe. It, you had a question? Yeah, well, I mean, so the cybersecurity angle in Congress right now really is whether they're going to pass a new comprehensive piece of legislation aimed around um, basically better protecting the Internet by making it easier for companies to share information about attempted intrusions on their networks. Yeah, well, the CISP has been part of it, and there's also various other pieces of legislation that if you broadly said, you know, cybersecurity and information sharing. Um, Companies want the government to give them a guarantee that if they share information that has private data in it, that they won't be held liable for that. So if I'm an internet service provider, I'm noticing attack on my network, I send you a set of data as the government, it's got, you know, people's emails in it, those people can't come back and sue me for violating their privacy. Um, That's, I think, an interesting way of breaking it down to the level of an individual, right? So it's saying that the government's saying that in order to better secure the Internet, it's going to have to look more deeply at the communications traveling on the Internet. Well, that means possibly your email or your text messages or your phone call if it's going over the network. And so looking for those ways to break it down to how does this affect you as an individual. Um, And then the Snowden slash surveillance story, 
links exactly into that because to do cybersecurity, you have to do surveillance of a network. So I think looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, what do individuals, what are they afraid of? What are they trying to protect? And, you know, what, and what's the corporate interest in this? There's also a question of whether or not these companies are going to be paid. I think probably security of the electrical grid <clears throat> is probably like the number one cybersecurity issue when you're talking about infrastructure. Um, you know, the fear that somebody could get into the systems, the, they're called the SCADA systems, the supervisory control and access systems that regulate power grids that are often connected to the Internet and manipulate them and cause the lights to go off, basically. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of been the nightmare scenario. Uh, there are, you know, the president has said publicly that foreign organizations have penetrated the systems that control the U.S. grid. That they, not that they've shut the lights off, but that they've gotten into the system. So that, to me, is probably one of the, like, ripest areas. And the question there becomes, so how does the government enforce that? So there's the FERC and there's the NERC, these two sort of electrical regulatory bodies. Um, you know, and I can never remember which one is, is it FERC or NERC that people think works better than the other. But to, you, to your point, this is what we're getting at here. You're talking about a loose network of sometimes big, sometimes small companies, and how do you force them to raise that level of security? And it's really, really hard. Right. And this is the problem you run into writ large with cybersecurity is that the vast majority of the network, probably 85 to 90 percent, and when I say the networks, I mean if you total up all of the computer networks in this country, so most of which are probably connected to the Internet in some fashion, 85 percent of them are privately owned. So the government can't go to those people and say, you must do the following to secure that network. Now they can try and create incentives um, to do it. Um, they can try, what they're doing now is trying to create what they call a framework of standards that they would then encourage companies to adopt. I think what would be more likely to, is more likely to happen is that if there is a major, like a true cyber attack, like the lights go out or something happens to a bank, then sort of like analogous to 9-11 when you saw a much stricter, kind of more draconian policy measures like the Patriot Act passed, you'd probably see a law forced on them and say, okay, from now on, yeah, from now on, like, you're an electrical grid, we don't care. You're implementing the following things, and we're going to send people in, and we'll create a whole new regulatory agency to do it. It's because it costs money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scary. Scary stuff.